Um, thank you so much for joining us. We know this word will significantly impact your life, so let's tune in. I'm so glad you're here today. We're starting a new series, and the title of the series is From Poverty to Prosperity. Say it with me, from poverty to prosperity. These are two words, and either we're living under one or we're living under the other. So what I want to do first, before I go deeper into the series, it's going to be a four-week series, and I would advise you, show up all four weeks. It's going to be worth it. By the time you're done with these four weeks, your thinking is going to change. And when your thinking changes, your results change. So we're going to cover this first, the definition of poverty. Poverty is to be in want, lack, empty, having little or no money as means of support or without hope. That's poverty. To be in want or lack or empty. Prosperity means this. And I'm going to give you a spiritual definition of prosperity. One is to know God and fulfill His purpose for our lives. And I'm going to go deeper into it, but I want you to get that. Prosperity is to know God and fulfill His purpose in our lives. That means that you could have all the money in the world, but if you don't know God and you're not fulfilling His purpose in your life, you are still in major poverty. But it goes deeper than just that, which is the most important thing. But let's go, let's talk about some other definitions of poverty. It says succeed in reaching. That means you're prosperous when you're setting goals, you're getting visions from God, and you're actually accomplishing them. So God doesn't just want you to start this race. He wants you to finish this race. Any struggles you're going through right now, God doesn't want you to get stuck in the struggle. He wants you to overcome the struggle, be more than an overcomer, and then help others overcome. Do you understand that when you're going through a tough time, it doesn't end with you? There are other people that are on the other side of your trial, your tribulation, or the wilderness experience you're going through. You overcoming is going to help other people overcome. This trial isn't just about you. This difficult season just isn't just about you. It's for you to overcome and help others overcome. That's called prospering. But prosperity also means to succeed in business. God wants us to succeed in any business activity we're in. It means to grow, to thrive, to increase. That means your best days are still ahead of you. It doesn't matter how old you are. So oh, my best days were behind me. It's not true. God knows no age. Your spirit doesn't get old. God says your best days, your increase. God wants you to thrive in your future. You got to believe this stuff because God's preparing us for more. But it also means an it means abundance. I mean, it means abundance or have a desired result. It means to be successful, fortunate, even in, fi especially in financial aspects. Now, God does want you to prosper financially as well. I looked in the scripture for the word poverty and 90% of the scriptures were giving us instruction to do one thing. 90% of the scriptures that talked about poverty were given instructions for the church or the people of God to do one thing. And this is what it said about poverty or the poor. It said this, take care of them. What did it say? You'll read in scripture over and over that our ministry is to take care of those that are lacking, don't have enough, are empty. So we have an assignment to take care of the poor. So that means if God's given us assignment to take care of the poor, we must not be part of that group. We must be part of another group, and it's called the prosperous. The prosperous take care of the poor. So right now, if you're in this room and say, Pastor, I'm really poor, I have really good news for you. God wants you to prosper from poverty to prosperity, and it can happen as you start believing what God has already given you. Someone say inheritance. I'm going to read you a scripture here, and it's in 2 Corinthians 8, 9. And this scripture is good news. And the good news about this scripture is that Jesus came to deliver us 
from every form of poverty and give us prosperity. He came to deliver us from every form of uh, poverty and give us prosperity. uh, Poverty doesn't come from God. Abundance and prosperity comes from God. That means when God is leading you, He's leading you to prosperity. He's never leading you to poverty. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says this. You know of the love and favor shown by our Lord Jesus Christ. The scripture is saying you should know something about the love and favor. Love and favor is another word for, uh, another word for that is grace. You know about the grace of God. This is what it's saying. Do you know that God did something for you that you didn't earn. He gave it to you because he loves you. Now, if God, if Jesus did something for me because he loves me and I didn't earn this, I want to know about it. Because if I don't know about it, I cannot participate in it. The Bible says my people perish for lack of knowledge. That means that they don't know what I've done for them. And because they don't know what I've done for them, they're living way below the vision that I have for them. So he did something for us. You know of the love and favor shown by Lord Jesus Christ. He was rich. Now Jesus was rich in heaven. In heaven, there's no homelessness. How many go with that? In heaven, there's no food lines. And in and, and, and heaven, there's no bad neighborhoods. As a matter of fact, in heaven, the streets are paved with gold. That's, that's, that's cold-blooded. Like, I just want some pavement from heaven, and I'd be rich. But in heaven, what we value, they just walk on. That's the atmosphere he came from. There's no devil living there. There's no poverty there. There's no pain there. There's no hunger there. There's no depression there. He came from that atmosphere. That's where we're going. But this is what he did. But he became poor for your good. He became poor for me, for my good. So he was rich and he became poor. This is what he did. He became poor who we were, so we could become who he is. Now, have you ever heard, and I know you have, that Jesus took all your sins on the cross and paid for them? What he did was he took on our sin on the cross, our penalty on the cross, and he gave us his righteousness or his forgiveness. We gave him our life and he gave us his life. Have you ever heard this? By, your, by his stripes, we were healed. What does that mean? He took on our sickness to give us his divine healing. That's called the divine exchange. He took on all of our bad so he could give us all of his good. You know what that's called? An inheritance. I don't know if you've ever had someone that's rich ever die in your family. But usually if someone rich dies in your family, everybody starts fighting. And everyone wants to see, they want to see the will. And if, and if your rich uncle didn't die instantly, Everybody starts coming out of the woodwork and starts showing up at his deathbed. Oh, uncle, I love you so much. Please don't leave me. Put me in your will, though. People are showing up because they want something that he has. Didn't see uncle for 10 years. But... My favorite uncle's dying. And he has a lot of money. I want to be included on the will. You would check it after he dies. 
If he told you that he left you a brand new house that was worth a half a million dollars, you'd want to look at the will. And if you loved your uncle, you love him, but you still want to know about the will. Why am I talking about this? Your Lord and Savior, he died, but he's alive. But he left you his will. It's called the New Testament, his last will and testament. And he's saying, church, my daughters, my sons, I've left you promises that you can cash in on if you just read my will. This subject, when we talk about prosperity, there's so much negative undertones of prosperity in even the church world today. Because I believe any message that's from God, you could twist and abuse. You guys get that? Like people could use a message to make themselves rich. This message is not to make me rich. This message is to let you know you're rich. And it's time for you to cash in on what God has left you so you can fulfill his assignment for you on this earth. Let's read the scripture. He was rich, but he became poor for your good. In that way, because he became poor, you might become rich. He became poor, so you might become what? Rich means to have an abundance so that you can give blessings to those in need, especially those in need of salvation. What he's saying is, I've made you rich, so when there's needs, you can meet them. And while you're meeting those needs, it's going to cause people to know that I died for them. And they're going to receive me as their Lord and Savior as they see you bless them in my name. He makes us rich with a purpose to bless others so that they will be saved. Are there people rich without that purpose? Yes. This scripture is saying that, I want you, this scripture is saying, I'm the one that's going to give you abundance so you can be a blessing so people will get saved for eternity. I'm going to give you finances with an eternal purpose. You guys get that? Now, if you're rich and you have no desire to see people get saved, you're actually very poor. And the reason you're very poor, your money has no purpose. And after you leave this earth, get this, and you stand before God, every dollar that you didn't invest in the kingdom of heaven will now speak against you. Your money has a voice. The scripture says that the, the money will tell them, look, I was supposed to be used for the kingdom and all you did was get yourself stuff. You saved me instead of invest in me. Just think about that. But for believers, and I want you to get, this, it's okay to have nice stuff. It's okay. I love, I love having nice stuff. I love, I love having, uh, I love having a nice bed. I bought me a bed that, that actually I can move up. It was, I love it. Just, I, 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 I want to watch somebody. Just, I don't know if I'm lazy, I like it. <laughs> they have a zero gravity one, you put, and it puts your legs up, and you, it's supposed to be perfect rest for your back, and like, <laughs> so I like having nice stuff. I love cars, and I, I love to eat good food. Anybody like to eat good food? You know, I don't want you to feel guilty for eating good, eat good. But while you're eating good and you're living good, don't forget about those that aren't eating good and aren't living good. It's okay. We can have both. Right? 
So Jesus said, I've made you rich and I've given you abundance so you could be a blessing, especially to those that need salvation. Rich. Okay. The Bible says this, let the poor say, I am rich. Say it with me, I am rich. Why is it important for you to confess that over yourself? Because it's part of your inheritance. Jesus already paid the price of the curse of poverty over our lives. Poverty is a curse. How do you know it's a curse? Because no one is impoverished in heaven. You guys get that? Let's keep going here. I'm going to tell you about four types of poverty. Four types of poverty. The first one we all know about. It's called financial poverty. This is the most popular poverty that is recognized. Worldwide poverty. Let's talk about that. Just worldwide poverty. So you guys don't even know this, but half of the world is in extreme poverty. Half of the world. Three billion people today, they live on $2 less than $2.50 a day. Three billion people live on $2.50 a day. 1.3 billion people are even more extreme in their poverty. They live on $1.25, a dollar and 25, less than a dollar and 25 cents a day. Over 1 billion children are in extreme poverty on this earth today, and over 22,000 children a day die of poverty. Now, we're talking about, this is not American poverty, this is worldwide poverty. They're stressed out right now. They need a little rice, they need some water to just live one more day. We Americans, even that are poor, are rich compared to them. They're stressed out about a meal. We're sometimes stressed out whether we're going to go to Taco Bell, McDonald's, or Pizza Hut. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I can't make up my mind. After church, I'm just so stressed out. We're stressed out when we go to Cheesecake Factory and the menu is too big. I can't even decide what I want. It's just stressing me out. <laughs> We're so rich that we got houses for our cars. It's called a garage. People are living in shacks, no running water. And, and then you show them your garage and you say, what? And they say, what is that? That's a house for my cars. A house for your cars? Yeah, and I don't even have my cars in there because I got too much stuff. <laughs> so it's just my extra stuff that I don't ever use. I just keep it in there. Come on, that's America. We're so rich that we go to dinner and people come serve us. And there's somebody cooking for us in the back. We're rich. We just order them with that. They said, I want medium well, please. <laughs> We're rich. But there is such thing as American poverty. And it's described as, as a household of four that make less than $25,000 a year. Now, it, American poverty hurts us as well. American poverty leads to... It, it, it leads to high stress levels. It leads to food insecurity. It's happening in America. It's happening in our city. There's families today that they're not sure where they're going to get their next meal. They're not sure what they're going to eat tonight right here in our neighborhoods. And how we know that, because we give a million pounds of food to hungry people and hungry families right here in this city. They're impoverished. They're food insecure. If we grow up in an impoverished area, the dropout rate is super high. You have a double chance to be a victim of a violent crime. You probably live in an unsafe neighborhood. 
So we're seeing the poverty in America affect people. If you're impoverished, if you're impoverished you got a better chance of dying young or getting sick and not recovering. These are the realities of our world today. There is a lot of poverty. But I thank God there's an answer. Jesus came to tell the poor, I got some good news for you. Let the poor say, I am rich. God wants to take us from one state and put us in another state altogether. Look at the answer. It's in Philippians 4.19. And my God will liberally supply, fill unto full your every need, any area that you're lacking. We have a God that will fill us until we're full and He will meet not some of our needs, He will meet every single one of my, your needs. This is what God is saying. Every area that you're lacking in is my business and I paid the price so I can meet the need right there. Yes, that area. And it says, it finishes, for every need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So what's our answer? Is to place our faith in, a, in, in God as our provider. Our faith in God releases his provision. Our provision comes from his unlimited resources. That's, that's very important. According to his riches. Why is it important for you to know it comes from him? It's important for you to know it comes from him because if you put faith in your bank account, in your resources, you're gonna, this is what's gonna happen. You're gonna have no faith. And God says, don't look at your bank, look at my bank. Don't look at your treasure, look at my treasure. I died to give you my treasure. Come on, give God some praise that God has some answers. He'll meet every single one of our needs. He's Jehovah Jireh, our provider. So, Pastor, do you believe in this? Of course I do. How, well, I'll prove it, Pastor. This is how I know. I, was, I had a job where I was making 250000 a year, you know, on average. And then God told me to leave that job and be the pastor of this church. And I got five kids. And I had a house I just built. 4,700 square foot house I just built, and my mortgage was $4,600 a month. And then God says, this is your last day on the job. You know what I did? I looked at the church bank account. And it had nada. <laughs> the truth was, it was the worst timing. The week before that, this is bad. This is how bad it was. We bounced some checks. We were writing checks by faith. <laughs> and Lisa was signing them. I wasn't signing those checks. That's what, serious. You, I tell this was really happening. It never happened again, but it happened then. Because it takes faith for God to be your provider. You, you know what's crazy about this? Because she wrote a few bad checks. <laughs> that I told her to write. <laughs> I go by faith on it. Boy, no, it's going to come in. It didn't come in. It bounced. Boom, 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 boom. boom. Real bounce. Bounce it real high. <laughs> you, it was worse than that. They, they, she got like a ticket. And, and, and what they... They sent her to a class. <laughs> How to budget. I go, Lisa, you better go to that class. You better buy bad checks and jump. <laughs> that's, a, that's bad news, right? Right in that time, God says, leave your job. And I want you to be a full-time pastor of the Wayward Outreach. 
And I remember I told Lisa that, that what God told me, and then she says, if God told you, go do it. And I'm like, hold, I'm a, hold on, hold on, wait a minute, hold on. <laughs> I go, honey, have you ever heard of praying before you do anything? She goes, no, if God told you, there's no praying, we just got to do it. So you know what I did? I got a second opinion. I called my mama up. And she was in Florida. I go, mama, this morning, <laughs> the Lord told me. I need to leave my job and be a full-time pastor of the way. And she goes, son, pray and get confirmation from the Lord. I go, Ma, you're so spiritual. I love you. (laughs) But then my dad, he's sitting back over there. My dad, he said, what did Marco say? He said, well, God, he said, and she goes, "Um, he said that God told him to leave his job and um, he's be a full-time pastor of the way. He goes, could I have the phone? So my dad gets on the phone. He goes, so what, 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 what happened? I go, well, God told me I need to leave my job. He goes, this is what you're going to do because I know you. He goes, you're going to, I'm going to hang up in just a second. You're going to go and you're going to resign right now. And I'm going to call you in two hours to verify you did it. Bye. <laughs> Come on. You know what I did? I was going to have him call me, oh, I forgot. <laughs> I'm a man, you don't tell me what to do. I, I was thinking about doing that anyways. <laughs> so I went down there. I called the owners in. God's a provider. I called the owners in. I go, look, man, today's my last day. And you know what I was doing? I was crying. <laughs> <laughs> but I did it. They offered me, this is what they offered me. He goes, Marco, why don't we do this? We'll ease out of it and we'll just, we'll offer you $10,000 a week, a month. And you just come in and train for us. And then we'll help you with that transition. I go, that sounds good, but that's not what God told me to do. He goes, and they go, you're crazy. I go, I know. <laughs> but you know what happened? God provided, God made a way. And he showed me, your job's not your provider. The economy's not your provider. The government's not your provider. How about putting your faith in me? I will supply every single one of your needs according to my riches and glory. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm barely going through this teaching today, but I'm slowing down. That week, something crazy happened. I remember that week I left the job. And in my house, and, and there's no, like, unemployment. I quit. There's no disability. I'm healthy. You guys could see. <laughs> so, that week it was the craziest thing happened. We have no money in the bank account of the church. I have no income. And I remember just being at home praying. So you got to pray just to make it today. That's MC Hammer for you guys don't even know about MC. (laughs) So now, Lisa, Lisa has a little Bible study for women on Friday. And there's only like 10 women there. We have a guest, like teacher coming in. We have no money in the account. Like, we always give a love offering if we have a guest speaker. We give, but we didn't have nothing. So we told the young, the lady, she goes, if you come, well, we'll just take an offering, and whatever the offering is, we'll give it to you. Something happened that week that never happened in the history of the church. That week, the offering with 10 ladies was 10 thousand dollars. It was 10,000 something, like 10,150 or something like that. So Lisa calls me. She goes, she goes, it's a miracle. God is providing all of our needs. 
10, so she calls me. She goes, what do I do? I go, huh? I go what, do mean, what do you do? You told her that whatever the offering is, you're going to give it to her. <laughs> Thanks again, buddy. No, I just can't. <laughs> bad around bad checks and doing this too. <laughs> So we wrote her a check. I don't even know who the lady is. Never met her. Never saw her again. I don't know how she looks like. I go, honey, we got to give it to her. That was the deal. Because see, what the enemy will try to do, how do you know you're not trusting God? When you try to hustle, you try to cheat, you start giving 8% instead of 10%. Well, you know, really, I'm tithe. How, how are you tithe? Well, I volunteer. That's my tithe. That ain't no tithe. If everybody did that, we couldn't even keep the lights on here. <laughs> I mean, you understand that. When, we, when we're not trusting God, we get a little sneaky. So I go, no, honey. I go, you got to give her the whole thing. So we wrote her a check for $10,000. I never got a thank you card. I wasn't expecting one, but I, maybe I was expecting Lisa, don't thank you. And it was gone. I mean, it was done. So we're still in the same place. That next Wednesday, some miracle happens. Wednesday night service. I want you to get our church just started. And the majority of our congregation are homeless people from the streets. So offering is very low. The way we were making it is because I was making a lot of money at the dealership. And I always make up the difference. Whatever it took. That week, that, that. Sir, second, uh, Wednesday night, the offering never happened. Uh, it's never happened again, even to this point, it's never happened again. The offering was $44,000. With all, so the, the ushers come in that week when I left. You know what God is saying? I will supply all of your need according to your riches, my riches and glory. You think you got it? I'm the one that has it. You got to trust me. How are you going to lead a church if you don't trust me as your provider in a city that's impoverished? You're, I want you to get this. You're not under the anointing of this city. You're under the anointing of heaven. You're under the anointing of my provision. Come on, put your faith in me. So, so the ushers come in, right? And they're all excited, oh, look. So they brought me the, the offering, it's a little paper. They don't give me that anymore, but they used to. It was a little paper, how many people came, how many kids served volunteers, and then they put the offering. I got mad at them, tell the truth. I go, you guys need to know math. <laughs> because that frustrates me a little bit. When someone says it's 44,000, it's actually 4,000. That just the commas in the wrong place. <laughs> so like I was like, come on, you guys need to know math. It's 4,400, not thousand. <laughs> and they said, no, it's 44,000. A lady gave $40,000. Well, I found out that that's, that Friday she gave $10,000. But we don't know who she is. We've never heard of her. God sent her to the church that week when I was willing to follow God's instruction and leave my job. Now, that money doesn't come to me. But God was saying, I'm taking care of my church. I'm taking care of my people. I didn't know who she was. The next Wednesday, she gave another $40,000. We're talking about $90,000 that week when I left, and I don't know who she is. And no one knows who she is. In that building, we used to have like a basement, it was like a dungeon. Or <laughs> downtown campus, it was, like, it was like a dungeon. It was like below sea level. <laughs> I, remember, I remember giving Susie her first office. And it wasn't an office, it was a, Susie, our chills pastor. We didn't have no room. I gave her an office, it was a closet. And I remember, I remember Michael, he's in our, my, our media department. He, one, one time he was just running out of the church. What kind of church is this? What kind of, just running out of church. 
I'm like, what is wrong with you? And what happens, because we're like below sea level, we had roaches that were like this big. Like, I mean, they came, they came from like dinosaur day. I'm serious. <laughs> big like this. So he's like, what kind of church is this? <laughs> you would hate to go to the bathroom there because you would always have a visitor. Like Lisa would never go to the bathroom at our downtown campus because it was crazy. I'd make altar calls and roaches would come too. And I'd be like. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Everybody close your eyes. Hallelujah. <laughs> it was, I'm not judging. That used to happen. I, there'd be roaches. <laughs> Come on, everybody, let's dance for the Lord. <laughs> so anyways, I went down in the basement area, right? And when we go in the basement area, there's a lady vacuuming. And I'm walking by her, and then I stop. I'd never seen her before. I go... Ma'am, I go, I've never seen you here. You, have you been here for a while? She goes, I just came last week. I go, what's your name? She gave me her name, but it still didn't match up with any name that was coming. I go, and I go, what brought you here? She said, God sent me. She said this, I got one month to live. I got pancreatic cancer. And God told me to come here to bless this church before I leave this earth. She goes, that's why I'm here. And lo and behold, it was like three or four weeks later, she was gone. That lady has mansions in heaven. That lady, come on. If it wasn't for that moment, that moment built a faith of a brand new preacher, a brand new pastor that was in a place that was impoverished, but that lady knew what true prosperity was. And she says, I'm not leaving this earth without doing everything that God called me to do. And today she's part of the way world outreach and every soul that we reach until Jesus comes back. That lady is part of that inheritance because God says, I make the poor rich. Oh, Lord. I got so much to teach. I, I just got to stop right here, though. We're just beginning this series. This is what I advise you to do. This next four weeks, I would not miss a service because we're going to take you somewhere that you've never been in your life. You're going to start experiencing the riches of heaven here on earth. And I'm not just talking about financial prosperity. I'm talking about emotional prosperity. I'm talking about, I'm talking about vision prosperity. Because some of us in this room, you're not impoverished financially, but you're impoverished emotionally. Emotionally, you're bankrupt. You're edgy. You're angry when you, you never used to be angry. You can't sleep at night. You have nightmares. You're hopeless, great fears. And I got good news for you. Jesus says, I give you a peace that the world can't give you. He goes, I solved that problem too. You know what that means? I'll give you tranquility in your spirit. I'll give you harmony in your relationships. Because when you're an emotional, when you're emotionally bankrupt, your relationships are bankrupt. Your thinking is bankrupt. You can't even think of great ideas. It turns into vision bankruptcy. And vision bankruptcy is just this. You cannot see past your present problems. And then God solved that too. He says, in the last days, I will pour my spirit upon all flesh and I'll give them prophetic words and dreams and visions. God wants to give you faith 
so you can see beyond your present problems. You're called to be a leader. And you know what leaders do? They can see how things are supposed to be and they look beyond the way things are now. God wants to give you vision because until you get vision, you remain in poverty. There was, there was a statement I want, I, 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 I guess I should say it. Her name's Helen Keller. Do you know she was deaf and blind? And she said the only thing worse than being blind is having sight with no vision. She was the first deaf and blind person to earn a bachelor's of arts degree. She became an author, a politician, an activist, and a lecturer. Como? How? Blind and deaf. But she had vision. And she, because she had vision, she was able to do what looked like impossible. Don't you let your past, your pain, your hurt stop you from dreaming and getting visions of God. Don't you look at your inadequacies and your shortcomings and disqualify yourself before you ever got started. God is saying if you have vision poverty, I'll give you sight. I've come to give sight to the blind. He's not just talking about blind people. He's talking about people that can't see a way out. I'm ready to quit. I'm ready to give up. I'm ready to commit suicide. It doesn't look like it's going to get any better. When you look at your future, all you see is pain. And the other thing that God wants to give us, He wants to fill our spiritual poverty. Spiritual poverty is this. The best scripture that I know that describes spiritual poverty is Mark 8:36 says, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life in the eternal kingdom of God? What he's saying is this person might have all the money in the world. They have things. They're right now maybe at a Ferrari dealership buying themselves a $500,000 Ferrari. They might have just bought their, a new watch this weekend that cost them $500,000. They're right now shopping for a mansion in Malibu that cost them $12 million. But the problem is, they're spiritually bankrupt. They go from car to car, from woman to woman, from thing to thing, from business adventure to business adventure. But deep down, they're impoverished. And the worst thing about it, what is the profit of man to gain the whole world and forfeit his eternal life? If they were to die in that condition, they're the most impoverished of all. Because it would be lost for eternity. Imagine giving your eternal life for the things of this world that perish that you can't take with you. We're all thinking about that since Kobe Bryant just left. The only thing I thought about when Kobe Bryant passed away last Sunday around this same exact time. The only thing I could think about, Kobe, did you have faith in Jesus Christ? Because all your accolades and your name and your shoes and the mansion and all even the good things that you did for your for kids if you don't know Jesus Kobe you lost you're lost for eternity and I pray that he did the good thing about it he went to church that morning and then he got in the helicopter with his daughter so thank God come on thank God for that and God just needs a you know, God's not, He's not hard. He just wants you to have a little faith. You give Him a little faith, He'll help you a lot. Un poquitito faith. <laughs> He'll help you a lot. You know why? He's really easy to please. Because He loves you. And because He loves you, He overlooks a lot of other junk. When someone really loves you, like my mama loved me, I was like a saint to her. Even when I did wrong, yeah, he did wrong, but he's a good boy. He's a really good boy. And that is the same thing with God with you. When you become a son and daughter, he forgives you. And he says, that's my daughter, and that's my son. Don't you talk about them. He said, but they messing up. I know, but my grace covers a multitude of sin. You relax there. I got that covered too. He's a good guy. 
If this message has been a blessing in your life and you would like to show support, please comment, like, share, and subscribe or click the link below so that you can contribute to our ministry. Thank you and God bless.